especially I hope you're there being here at the same time. Yeah, yeah. What time? What time do you have over there? A little bit earlier than us. We are at six o'clock now. Six p.m. Six o'clock in the evening. Okay. Are you are you running shul services now? Are you in lockdown? What what is the situation? No, the, the, the situation presently is we are in lockdown. Our numbers, whilst um, they maintain a very strict, strict protocol throughout all the COVID until recently, for the first time, two weeks ago, they asked us to close the shoes. They actually ask. So um, the approach in the government here is a very gentle approach, very um, respectful approach. So for the sake of supporting the government with the houses of prayers kindly close down so that no contamination occurs. However, we want the rabbis and the, and, the, and the priests and the imams to please continue praying to God. We want you to continue having your prayer services, even if it's via Zoom, because we know that only through the spirit of God's intervention will this pandemic be put behind us. That's the kind of approach the government uses to requests um, from the um, house of worship um, to actually close down. And it's a request. Mm -hmm. It's the mm -hmm. same as in Johannesburg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Alekhan Rib, how are you? Baruch Hashem, thank you. We're very well. So long, Rabbi. Yeah. Um, okay, so well, I think we'll just, uh, we'll just give it one or two more minutes and, uh, and then we'll kick off. And uh, we'll just do a brief introduction. Um, and then we'll hand over to you, Rabbi Suiza. Yes. And uh, we've also got a chat facility over here, so people will be able to type in questions and answers, uh, questions rather, and you'll hopefully be able to give them answers sure. um, as, as we are proceeding. Very good. Very good. Are they not I can just, I'll, sorry, I'll, I'll, I can just excuse myself at half past. I have to go to another appointment. So we'll be here. Looking very, very forward to hearing what you always to say. Okay, so are we looking at how much time in total, Rabbi? Rabbi Handler, Rabbi Joe? Uh, well, I think we have, uh, uh, you know, we, we have um, uh, approximately an hour. Normally these webinars are an hour, but, uh, you know, if people have more questions that they want to ask and, and you're willing, then we'll see how it goes. Let's see how okay, it goes. Okay, good. good. I'm, I'm quite happy to carry on if they, they want to have some questions answered. I'll be happy to see if I can answer them. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, so uh, we basically uh, are ready to start. And, There's 100, uh, 101 people. 101 so households. Uh, 101 households, so there's probably like about 130 people at the moment and climbing. Um, so, Rabbi Suiza, I think that we are uh, quite excited to be here that. Uh, you know, Portugal, is, as far as the Jewish community is concerned, I actually had a quick look on the internet earlier this afternoon. They talk about a 2,000 year old history, which is quite astonishing. And, uh, and of course, there's been like a revival and there are many thousands of Jews at the moment, as you're going to share with us in a moment. So just before we hand over to Rabbi Suiza, we want to say number one, thank you very much for taking out the time. Uh, to uh, uh, be our guest on our, our webinar over here. Uh, we've, we've extensively publicized this webinar in Cape Town, and I'm sure you have a number of people, maybe more than a number of people from Cape Town who are joining. And uh, of course, uh, thank you to Rabbi Shaw. He's got a very large dynamic community. And of course, uh, we have our very good friend and neighbor, Rabbi Akiva Gilbert, who um, is helping to host the webinar tonight and of course runs uh, the OJE, which is a very uh, successful outreach organization. So, uh, and of course, welcome to everybody else. It's really wonderful to have everybody on the Sunday evening. And uh, just to mention for those people, I think Rabbi Suiza, most people from Cape Town know exactly who you are. You don't need an introduction, but uh, the people from Johannesburg, just uh, very briefly to say Rabbi Suiza, was a rabbi in um, uh, Cape Town for decades, right? What, more than 30 years, I would imagine. 40 right? years. And uh, he was also a, 40 years. And he was also a Dayan on the Beit Din, 
He was a sofer uh, there. Um, he was one of the main shoich team there. He was involved in all aspects of Jewish life in Cape Town, literally for a lifetime. And just uh, uh, last year, he got the calling to go to Lisbon uh, to join as the chief rabbi of Lisbon. And I think it's um, quite an exciting phase in your life. It's a whole new world, a whole old world that's a whole new world. So uh, thank you very much. And I think it's quite exciting and fascinating to hear um, about different aspects, your community, what's going on over there today, what happened in the past, the whole issue about uh, passports, how Lisbon and Portugal have gone out of their way to welcome Jews from all over the world if they've got some kind of a link. And uh, of course, I suppose at the end, we're going to ask you when we finally become tourists again, we're allowed to travel overseas, we're going to ask you, what's it like to be a tourist uh, uh, in Lisbon? Is it exciting? Is it interesting? But at any rate, um, Rabbi Suiza is going to share with us some comments. And uh, whoever would like to, please uh, put uh, comments on the chat and, and he'll, he'll be happy to answer. So thank you very much. And it's a great honor and a pleasure to uh, hand over to Rabbi Suiza, who is currently the chief rabbi of the Lisbon Jewish community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbis. And thank you very much, everyone, intervening through the process of allowing me this platform today. Thank you, Rabbi Handler, old friends. And it's wonderful to be part of the um, South African community, even from a distance of um, Lisboa. We don't like to call it Lisbon, we like to call it Lisboa because that's, that's the actual Portuguese name. Um, what I'm going to start with, I'm going to share with you some of my personal impressions since I've arrived here. Because I think that in itself would allow you to see history through my eyes in the last five months. So I always had this romantic idea of the uh, Sephardi communities of Spain and, and Portugal. I had a romantic idea. Why? Because I was born in North Africa, a Spanish father, a Moroccan mother, and I have a Spanish nationality. I'm Spanish. I'm, I'm a Spanish citizen. And I'm also a South African citizen now. So I, I have dual citizenship. But I had this vision of Spain and the history of Sephardi Jewry but I never really got to grips with that history because at a very young age, I went to Yeshiva and then I studied there from Yeshiva, I went to Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe to Cape Town. So in reality, I'm a Sephardi in exile. Because at a young age, left home, was exiled to England, and then, and then Africa, born in North Africa, and lived 40 years in South Africa. And now I find myself back into my retirement sort of age into this romantic idea of a wonderful Sephardi community of where I think my family and I stem. So, so my impressions have been, wow, I can now serve into a Sephardi community. I was actually taught by, by Sir Moses Montefiore's funds in the Spanish and Portuguese community in London. So the yeshiva was called Yeshiva Judith Lady and that was Sir Moses Montefiore's wife. Because they were, of, they were of Sephardi, Italian, and of course also Portuguese um, descendants. So my impressions have been, wow, there is a Sephardi community. Uh, and I come sort of with this mindset that I, I speak Spanish, so Portuguese won't be too difficult. I speak Latino, so even, even a little easier. Um, just to tell you, to illustrate the concept of how Portugal sees the Jews, for example, this is an impression, yes? And I'm sharing with you not historical cold facts, but rather impressions. My impression was about two, three weeks ago, we got a, an invitation from the government to attend to the parliament. We are in lockdown. The parliament is applying all the protocols necessary, but yet they have to run the country. So social distancing, sanitizing, everything is in effect. So they want us to attend. Why does the government want the president of the Sephardi community or the Jewish, we call ourselves the Israeli community of Lisbon, uh, Comunidad Israelita de Lisboa. So it actually is half Sephardi and half Ashkenazi, believe it or not, it's actually about 50%. We have 400 members in the community approximately. And we were called to the parliament, why? Because they were adopting the UN resolution for the concepts of anti-Semitism. This is a country where they wanted the 
president of the community and the rabbi of the community to be present so that everyone in the parliament could actually see us. We could see them pass the resolution and the, and the speaker of the house took the entire resolution to, to the um, credit or rather to the memory of the victims of the Holocaust. Of course, the resolution was embraced by the entire parliament. There was a standing ovation to the chairman for adopting it. And of course, then he mentioned us that we are represented today with the presence of the president of the community and the rabbi and everybody turned around and they gave us a standing ovation. Now, I don't know many parliaments in Europe that would do that. So Portugal loads tremendous um, respect and dignity to the Jewish community here. Another example, we have access to all the national televisions. We're a small community. This is a country of 10, 11 million inhabitants. In total, we think there may be between four and 5,000 Jews in Portugal. Um, there are many Israelis that are coming to settle here. I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. Um, but in total, we 4,000 people, but the government want us an occasion, whatever the occasion may be, in acknowledging the different religions in the country. And the Jewish one is always present there. So um, very important to place that into some sort of perspective when you're thinking in terms of Europe at the moment, right? Um, we've been touring the country and what we often found um, is little, little stones in little cobbled neighborhoods in the little towns surrounding Lisboa where you have Rua de Juderia, the street of the Jews. By the way, someone, a historian told me that wherever you see novo Christians, new Christian street, those were the Jewish quarters in where the Jews actually lived um, after the Inquisition. We'll get to the historical facts in a minute. So um, the history of Jews in, 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 in this part of the world, by the way, important also to know that when the word Sfarad is used in the Torah, we actually find it in the Nevi'im Ktubim. We find it in Ktubim as Sorfat and Sfarad. But really, I, I don't know that it necessarily refers to the word Spain, although if liberally translated today, Sefarad is Spain. When in the time of Obadiah and Nabi, it was possibly at the same time as Yermiyahu. And the word Sfarad is that the Galut of Yerushalayim that is in Sfarad will come back and inherit the land of Israel from Nehesa. So the word Sfarad is used, but Sfarad, I think, is the Iberian Peninsula. I don't think it refers necessarily to that Spain. So the Iberian. Um, we know that after the Roman, the Roman, and I'm going into a little bit of history, the, the Roman Empire took 30,000 Jews after the destruction of the temple to build their roads in, 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 in a peninsula called the Iberian Peninsula, which was under the Roman Empire. 30,000 Jews were taken captive to build their roads. When they finished with the building, they were sold as slaves. Who was buying them? This is the mystical part. Other Jews were buying them and they were actually releasing Pidion Shvoyim. This is the concept of Pidion Shvoyim over 2,000 years ago under the Roman Empire. There were all already Jews in the Iberian Peninsula even before that. The history of, of Portugal is different from the history of Spain in many, many instances. But one must not assume that what happened in Spain in reality is what happened in Portugal. There were Jews in Portugal, believe it or not, before a country called Portugal existed. There were Jews in Spain before a country called Spain actually existed. So the Jews were here for over 2,000 years. They've been and, and And there is discoveries to that effect. But he said that we will tell you a little bit about the 15th century onwards. So from the 15th century onwards, um, the Jews occupied indeed, at that time, prominent places all over the kingdom of Portugal. 
um, the king of Portugal, the first king that declared the country, actually already had Jews in the central cities of Portugal living there before it became a country. But we know that, for example, Don Ischaka Brabanel, the great Don Ischaka Brabanel, um, he was a treasurer of King Alfonso V of Portugal. And he had an incredible role in the relationship with the king and also in appointing diplomats and merchants into the courts of the kingdom. Um, cities like Lisboa and cities like Evora were important Jewish communities. They had, they had total um, permission to worship Hashem in any way they saw fit. Yes, it is true. It is true that when the Christians conquered this part of the world, or rather reconquered it from the Muslim, the Muslim conquered it in 711, and the reconquest of the Christians took several hundred years to recover both Spain and Portugal from the, from the Muslim mass that had taken over. In the 15th century, already there have been tremendous auto de fe, in other words, co forced conversion and attack against Jews in the synagogues of the Kingdom of Spain. By the way, the word Spain is not accurate. Uh, what we know as Spain today, in medieval time, there was no Spain. It was divided into a whole bundle of different kingdoms. So there was a kingdom of Castilla, there was the kingdom of Granada, there was the kingdom of Asturias, there was the kingdom of Navarra. What really happened in terms of Judaism, the Jews in Portugal lived quite happily, protected by the kingdom for, for centuries, from the 11th till the 15th century. They had some obligations, yes. They imposed extra taxes on the Jews. They had to actually live separate from the Christian um, neighborhoods. So they were called the Juderia, and that's where you find in all the little towns in, in surrounding Lisbon, you find little towns where there is Rue de Juderia, the street of the Jews. And, and they were welcome. In other words, they traded freely. They had to identify themselves as Jew. So there would be a sign or a garment that they had to wear in order to identify themselves as Jews. They were protected by the kingdom, okay? They, they could develop autonomous, total autonomous authority. They established mikvaot, they established school, they established synagogue. I'm talking 15th century. And there was little, if any, persecution of the Jews in Portugal while there was massive slaughter already in 1391 in Spain. This was the explosion of the anti-Jewish feeling in the Spanish kingdoms, and it wasn't happening in Portugal. So much so, Rabotai, that in 1492, and I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions shortly. In 1492, when the Inquisition edict was implemented by the Kingdom of Castilla, okay, we have to remember that the Kingdom of Castilla was central in Spain. There were various kingdoms surrounding it. But Castilla, they implemented the final edict of, of dispersion of the Jews. So either you convert or you leave, and the ultimatum was given. When the Jews were looking for shipping lanes to leave Spain in 1492, in some of those, in one of those ports was none other than Christopher Columbus. It was known as Christopher Colon. It was in the same port, 1492, Ishavea, that's the day. And he, he refused to sail. And when the queen, Queen Isabella, who promulgated the edict of the Inquisition, she, she instigated the entire process. Isabella I of Castilla, she asked Columbus, why are you not sailing since the currents are good, the winds are perfect? Why do you refuse to, to sail? And Columbus says, the omens are not good. It was Tisha B'Av. And the Jews were in the same docks looking for shipping to actually be exiled from Spain. But many people don't know that was about 200 to 250,000 Jews in what we call Spain, was the kingdom of Castilla, of course, 
and the kingdom of Aragon. So there were two different kingdoms. Um, what we don't know is some sailed immediately as the Inquisition became, the Inquisition edict of expulsion became implementable. Some did not, some walked. Half of them actually walked. And this is very interesting. Half meaning a hundred thousand Jews literally walked to the border of Portugal. This is the source of Sfarad. I mean, it is started in the kingdom of Castilla and Aragon and all the other kingdoms of Spain. But in reality, half of them literally walked to Portugal. And the king of Portugal imposed a charge on them. I think it was eight maravedas of gold, four, eight gold coins. He, if you had a profession that they needed in their country, they reduce it to 50%. Interesting. So if you were a jeweler or a leather worker, they reduce it to four maravedas per person. So that was the tax to enter Portugal and therefore find a safe haven for Jews. When they came, there were already 30,000 Jews in Portugal. 30 to 40,000 Jews were living there since time immemorial. And this 100,000 came to the borders, crossed the borders, and felt safe within the boundaries and at the border of the land of Spain, of the Kingdom of Castilla. Um, of course, it wasn't long before there was a shidduch. And this is the most terrible shidduch in the history of Sephardi Jewry. Because the Kingdom of Portugal wanted to make a shidduch with the Kingdom of Castilla. And the demand of Castilla, as it were, for a wedding present was that they would expel the Jews from Portugal as well. Or they had to make them Christians. So there were two options, either expel them or make them Christians. The Kingdom of Portugal did not want to expel the Jews. When the wedding date arrived, as before, Kingdom of Portugal asked their priests to sit at the docks. They gave them six months to leave Portugal, the Jews that were already in Portugal, because it was coming up for the final edict of expulsion. And they baptized them against their will. They baptized 100,000 Jews, literally, one day. And they were then free to remain in the country thinking that they would be safe and protected by the Kingdom of Portugal. What the Kingdom of Portugal did not know was that the Shidduch would also allow the intervention of the Inquisition to come into Portugal. And the King of Portugal gave the Jews 20 years to either. 20 years was a long period of time, supposedly, not in history, but supposedly, to either embrace Christianity or have those 20 years to get out because when the edict came, they would be persecuted. And therefore, it was prohibited to believe in the law of Moshe Rabbeinu in the Torah. It was a prohibition and the penalty for believing or practicing anything to do with Judaism was the penalty of death, death by execution. Okay? And this became radically implemented more aggressively, if you like, in Portugal than it actually was done in Spain. So this is the history from the 15th century. There are communities. One of the things that challenges me intellectually and halachically is the fact that have people come into shul and say, we are Jews, but we are Jews of Portugal for 500 years. There is a community here in Belmonte. These are the original Portuguese Jews who married their first cousins and kept the Jewish religion in practice under their homes in cellars. They were mikvaot. They hid prayer books. They prayed and continued believing in Hashem. These people are coming to me and say, and of course they are sensitive, but we, what, what are we to call them? How dare we say to them after what they've been through, if you don't produce a document, you are not acceptable to the world jury. How dare we tell them? 
400 years of intermarriage and practicing Judaism, they're knocking at the synagogue's door right now as we speak. Yeah, there are a bundle of them. We have in the community Portuguese Jews who have never left this country remained adherent to Quran mitzvot, they read Hebrew, they keep mitzvot, they believe in Hashem, they can read the Torah. These, these are people, they, these are people who kept the religion going when everybody else had already left the country. So in reality, this is the jury of Portugal. Of course, the modern uh, jury is slightly different. I'm going to stop and allow you to perhaps direct me with some questions. But this is the jury of Portugal as it is right now. The modern community welcome, no anti-Semitism of any kind. You tell, you walk in Portugal with a kippah, nobody stares at you. If you say you're Jewish, they give you a big smile and they welcome you wherever you go and you say you're Jewish, is they only demonstrate admiration, respect and dignity to you. Many of the Portuguese people I encounter regularly in the street and I tell them I'm a rabbi, they point to their veins and they say, we have Jewish blood too. Remember, when the exiles of Castilla came here, there were 100,000, there were 30,000 Jews already in, in Portugal and the entire population was a million. So the Jews made up between 10 and 15% of the local population, literally, of a night, in a matter of a few days. And those Jews remained here. Many of them remained here and embraced Christianity outwardly, but practiced, sorry, outwardly, but practiced Judaism inwardly. So this is the history of that community. What we have today are modern Jews coming back from Morocco, from different France, from Spain, from many different countries. I'm stopping here and allowing for some questions at this stage. Okay, can you hear me, Reva Suiza? Yes. Okay, so while we're waiting for some questions, um, maybe just ask you, uh, has the Portuguese government um, ever done something? Okay, you mentioned uh, about the Holocaust and so on, um, but have they done anything to formally um, do tshuva, you know, to acknowledge? I remember uh, uh, quite a few years ago, the late Rabbi Harris and a couple of us rabbis, we attended a Catholic a gathering where they actually formally apologized. There's, there's a whole movement in the Catholic Church where they apologized for the Catholic anti-Semitism of the last many thousands of years. Uh, did you find that the, the Portuguese uh, leadership has formally ever done something to uh, to acknowledge the uh, what happened you know, all of these years ago? Yes. Yes, the president of the country and the entire government a couple of years ago went to a town on the border with close to Spain, and this place is called Castillo Blanco, the, the, the White Castle. That was one of the entry areas into Portugal by the Jewish masses from Castilla, and that became a, a, a living Jewish village, literally, completely um, consisted of Jews. And there, there was a formal apology for the, for the criminality, for the execution, for the burning alive, for the persecution, for the evil perpetrated against the Jews by the president of this country, so much so that in 2013, Portugal extended what they would call um, a, a um, nationality granted, Portuguese nationality will be granted with immediate effect on proving that you are a descendant of Sephardi to anyone, any Jew in the world, in fact, not Jew, even non-Jews. Anyone who claims descendancy from any of those expelled by the Inquisition or by the Kingdom of Portugal can claim immediate nationality with a passport granted, and we have already granted it. Uh, some 17 to 20,000 passports, mostly to Sephardi Jews from Israel, mostly, but there are some from, from uh, England, France, 
and other countries in the world, the United States, and, and there is application for another 60 to 70,000 um, passports to be granted. We have, we, our synagogue employs historians to link the families all the way back. And once that is done, it's submitted to the Ministry of Justice and a passport is immediately granted, unquestionably to anyone who claims Sephardi descendancy. So that's, that, that's the conscience of the government of Portugal. That, that's how they, they apologize publicly. They acknowledge the evil. They welcome the Jews back. And in fact, they want the Jews back. Um, there, there's been an objection in, in government that it shouldn't just be a passport, but it should actually come with a visit. They must come and visit. So, so they want you to come and visit. And so this is the way they want to extend the welcome back to the Jews, knowing that what was done to us was terribly evil. In the plaza, in the center of plaza here, um, a kilometer away from where, a kilometer and a half maybe, um, Jews were burnt alive in the 15th century because they believed in the Torah. That's it. That was the crime. Uh, Rabbi, um, one of the other questions that came through uh, is that have you um, met any Moranos? Okay, we like to be extremely uh, careful on what, how we name them. Yes, I understand that that's a common name. Uh, there are several names by which they are referred. And so um, we, we have, I have, I have met, they are not called Moranos, they are called Jews. They like to think of themselves being Jews. Uh, Maranos is an extremely derogatory term in Spanish, which means a pig. Why a pig? Because it's showing external signs of being Christian, which is a split hoof, but it's showing internal signs of being treif, which is doesn't chew the curry, it's a Jew inside. So the, 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 the Christians, um, the, the, the Catholic, the church, the Inquisition gave them that name Maranos. By the way, there is another gentler explanation, Mar-anus, Mr. Compelled to convert. So anus is what they like to be called them, Bene Anusim, that's the name they prefer, but truly they prefer the name Jews. And I, I understand why they prefer the name Jews. Very logical. Because they saying, we fought to remain Jews for 400 years. Who are you to come here and not tell me that I'm not Jewish unless I produce a document? It is an intellectual challenge as well as a halachic. Many of them come to Daven in our synagogue. They read, they, they read the Philot beautiful with a very Portuguese accent. And they read beautiful. These people are Jewish. And by the way, some of them have letters from the Rabbanut Rashid that recognize they are Jews. One of them has a letter from the previous chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Ammar, saying this is a Jew who's kept religion for 500 years. They married, they know who is Jewish, by the way. When I have a query, I call some of these elders, some of these people in my community, and I said, this, is, this person with a name like this from a village like that, claims to be Jewish, what's your opinion? And they know exactly, they know, they kept records. They married their first cousins for 400 years. They, they are called Bene Anusim. These are the sons, those who were compelled to embrace Christianity. They weren't even compelled to embrace. They were just thrown some water and said, forthwith, you are now a Christian. That's how they were baptized against their will. They actually, their children were taken away from them, sent to islands, of Santo Tomas, by the way, uh, the Inquisition didn't just work in Spain and Portugal. I think it's a misconception to believe that. The Inquisition went as far as Mexico, as, as far as South America, and executed Jews there in Peru. Okay, so the Inquisition tentacles ran through the entire continents of the world, uh, and they were they were highly structured, highly organized. And all the records, records are dozens, if not hundreds of volumes of every investigation that the Inquisition uh, practiced, every question asked of the person accused of Judaizing, that's what the term they use, 
Judaizing, believing in the Torah. Every question was written down. Every exclamation or response was written down. The Inquisition record showed perfect recording of every event of every individual that was ever um, accused of being a Jew and judged. Any other questions? Can you hear me? You, may, you mentioned that there are approximately 17,000 people that have received uh, Portuguese passports yes. as uh, being descendants of, of previous generations. Um, is it there? What is the general tendency? Is it they, they just want the passport or that they want to actually come and live in Portugal? And does Portugal offer them any financial incentives to come and live there besides the actual passports themselves? A similar thing to, I think, what goes on in Germany, that there are a lot of financial incentives for Jews who come and live in Germany. Okay, so what, they, what, what really what the government here wants to do is make up the damage on the one hand and apologize and, and, and actually, actually extend a welcome to Jews to come back. Uh, we Jews understand that because, you know, stimulating the economy is part of the Jewish incentives. But no, they, they grant you a passport uh, and that's where it actually rests. Um, but they, are, they welcome you. There are, there are many, many Israelis now settling in the areas surrounding Lisboa. Um, they're buying farms and, and you hear them in the streets when you go uh, on walks. So Hebrew is more commonly being heard now. Of course, there is tourism as well, uh, but there are lots of Jews. There are two magazines. Uh, I'm going to show them to you, if you can see. The two very, very popular local magazine. This is called Sabado. Okay, this is a magazine. I know you got the reverse. But this is a, a local magazine where it says Judeos. This is one of the most popular magazines in Portugal, in Lisbon. Judeos, the Jews, how they change Portugal. So how they change Portugal, they innovated. From the um, Second World War, thousands of Jews were allowed to come through Portugal looking for protective lands to welcome them. By the way, important to know that even the Lubavitch Rebbe, Zechel Tzadik Livrocha, he came through Portugal. He actually was here. Um, personalities that were here, Yosef Caro. Yosef Caro in the Inquisition Edict of Spain came to live in Portugal with his parents. So Maran Shulchan Aruch, none other, actually from age four till age nine, lived in, 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 in the areas of Lisbon, okay? Um, of course, we know Don Ischaka Bravanel, and we know um, Baruch Spinoza. Everybody's heard of Dona Gracia of the House of Nasi, who helped all the Jews escaping from the Iberian Peninsula to Amsterdam, okay? She, she, she developed an entire um, um, infrastructure for Jews escaping during the Inquisition time. She was from Portugal as well. Um, and so, so in reality, it, it has an incredible history. From the Second World War, it is known that through Portugal, these are records, between 100,000 to a million Jews escaped through Portugal into the New World during the Second World War. Um, there, were, there is a, Recently, we honored the memory of a Portuguese ambassador called um, Aristide. His full name, um, his full name, I have it here. The, the street on which Chabad House is in uh, Kashkai. Kashkai is 20 kilometers from Lisbon. Um, we got a magnificent uh, Chabad House there. About six weeks ago, they named the street after the um, ambassador who allowed um, about 30,000 Jews to be saved when the government of Portugal instructed under pressure of the Nazi regime to stop Jews escaping from France. 
there was a Portuguese ambassador who defied the government. In defiance for a week, he granted 30,000 visas to Jews escaping over the Pyrenees, and they were safe. And, and the government, of course, took him um, to task and severely punished him. They, they, released, they released him from his job. And uh, in Yad Hashem, he's recognized his full name is Aristide da Souza Mendes. Remember that name, because if you visit Portugal and Chabad in particular in Kachkais, where my friend Rabbi Eli Rosenberg is, you will see that the street, the street name is Aristide da Souza Mendes. That was the French, French Portuguese ambassador, or rather the Portuguese French ambassador, who allowed 30,000 Jews to survive the persecution of Nazi Germany, and they were saved. So in the Yad Vashem, he has a full recognition of this, because he had 15 children and he lost his job, and the government tried to destroy him and found him guilty of insubordination. Um, and he died, he died in terrible agony and in poverty. So his memory is, is, is perpetuated in Yad Vashem um, as olam, one of those who saved hundreds, if not thousands, of Jewish people from persecution by Nazi Germany. Any other question? Another question that uh, was asked over there is, uh, the Jews that are moving back to Portugal now, how are they acclimatizing, especially the English speakers? Okay, my wife is English speaker. She speaks uh, Afrikaans and English. She manages very well. By the way, Portugal today is a magnificent, secure, wonderful country of highly respectable and tolerant um, uh, society. They have incredible patience, are extremely polite. Um, it's an incredible society to be able to live in a place like this. Very safe at all times of day or night. And English is spoken very, very liberally through the entire uh, Portuguese society. So um, they all speak, they all speak English as well. Um, and if you speak Spanish as well, then that is extremely helpful, of course, because Portuguese can understand Spaniards a hundred percent. Spaniards like me can only understand Portuguese 60, 70 percent. Somehow um, it's much easier the other way around because we got less vowels. They have a lot more vowels in their pronunciation. But one thing I didn't tell you is the Jewish connection through Portugal to the entire discovery of the world. That's an interesting, um, uh, perhaps, uh, anecdote that I want to share with you. Um, there was a great rabbi called Rabbi Abraham Zakuto. Now, Rabbi Abraham Zakuto he actually was from Spain, came to live in Portugal. And he, he improved uh, a, a, an instrument called, he, he was a cartographer. He actually drew maps. And there is correspondence in the record that Columbus, Christopher Columbus, and Zacuto corresponded, right? And he, Columbus, asked Zacuto about how to charter the oceans correctly so that he would discover new land. Now, it wasn't just Columbus who did that. There is a poem here in Portugal that they sing as a song of an old rabbi meeting Vasco de Cama in a little place called Belém. I visited Belém. It's a beautiful little tourist area. There is a poem here perpetuated into music. Vasco de Gama, the discoverer Vasco de Gama, met with an old man with a beard. And there is a poem told. Who was that old man? Rabbi Abraham Zakur. Rabbi Abraham Zakuto improved the astronaut and gave it to Vasco da Gama and he gave him advice how to deal with the currents in the ocean. So it wasn't, so it was Vasco da Gama, it was um, Christopher Columbus, and it was um, Bartolomeo Diaz. So the Cape of Good Hope was charted safely by a Portuguese discoverer who had an instrument on his ship designed by a Jewish rabbi. Folks, this is reality. You can look it up. Astrolobe is what gave them the latitude in order to charter the oceans effectively. And that was designed by Kreska, Rabbi Kreska, okay, from Spain, and passed on to Rabbi Zacuto, who then improved it. 
Rabbi Zakut, of course, published many religious works. He published the, the Hebrew calendar, it's called Chibur Gadol in his young age. He published Biur Luchot in terms of navigation, in terms of the oceans and the currents. So, so these this were personalities of Portuguese origin and, of course, Castilian before that, who contributed tremendously to the discovery of the new world by the input of great Jewish and Sephardi minds as well. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, there's quite a few different questions that are coming in for different uh, places. One of the questions that asked is, realistically, how easy or complicated is it for someone uh, to prove that they are of Sephardi descent? Okay, it is a good question. I had a Zoom with about uh, 20 people that run the office, two professors of history, non-Jewish, and the rest are research clerks, lawyers. Um, so, so if you apply and you really, by the way, also important to note that the Portuguese government is serious about granting that nationality where the Spanish government copied it from the Portuguese, ran it for two years, and then they, two or three years, then they stopped. They granted very few passports. It was a publicity, and I say that because I'm Spanish. I can't criticize Portugal, I'm a guest, but I am Spanish. Um, the Spanish was a little bit of a facade and a copy of the Portuguese. The Portuguese government is serious. Every person who's applied and truly has far the ancestry, whether they were in Portugal or not, doesn't matter. If they were in the kingdom of Castilla or the kingdom of Aragon, and from there they went to Turkey or Izmir or Salonika, they would get a Portuguese passport. If you can link it to the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal takes full responsibility not only for their Inquisition edict, which was evil, but they take responsibility for the Spanish one as well. And so we think and we believe that every application is successful if it's true. Yes. We need to establish the criteria. And, and, and our professors were asking me how to investigate somebody who still has some Jewish custom. And, and incredible things came in that Zoom because these professors know history, but you know, they don't know little, little squiggle in a little old sitter what it means, but it could be Hebrew. I, I told them that they find any writing in any document that anybody who applies uh, produces, please, those documents must be passed to me. There are two established communities that grant passports, our central community of Lisboa, our synagogue, and the one in Porto. They have a, a beautiful synagogue in Porto. The Holocaust Museum has just been now uh, consecrated about uh, two months ago. Uh, they built a Holocaust uh, a museum in Porto. They have a magnificent synagogue, two rabbis, very dynamic synagogue with a mikveh, with a minyanim running, with kashrut, with a little kosher hotel, even restaurant. Uh, Baruch Hashem is a very successful community in Porto, 200 and 210 kilometers north of us. And we have kosher shops in Portugal now, Baruch Hashem. We have tourist groups coming. We are able to arrange everything, every one of their needs. The, the applications are literally all granted. Um, not the Spanish one, and I, I, I warn people, not, I, I simply warn because it's a waste of money. You know, I, I don't want people to waste money and apply to Spain. If you're under 18, Spain, Spain did grant a few thousand passports to under 18 children, but anybody over 18 had to come for an appointment in, in Spain and then have to speak a little bit of Spanish, know Spanish history, and so it was very complicated. With Portugal, there is no such requirement. You submit the documents to an attorney. The attorney gives it to the Minister of Justice. The Minister of Justice passes to the shul, my shul. Um, our historian do all the research and analysis and, and, and uh, put the files together, submit it back to the Minister of Justice. Between 12 and 16 months, your passport is given. That's it, done. That's amazing. Um, some of the other questions that are being asked over here is that they wanted to just try and know what is the Jewish education for youth? 
um, in terms of Jewish day schools and bringing up kids, etc., in Portugal? Unfortunately, at the moment, very little. This is something we're trying to work on. We, we, we please God, hoping that after this COVID uh, lockdown, we are going to look into starting a little, hopefully, a little nursery school. There are, there are Israelis expressing interests in having their children attending. We know that there are hundreds of Israelis in Lishboa. They are not associated with the Beta Knesset. They, they, they are coming from Israel, settling in the area. Uh, the ambassador is a close friend of the community here, the Israeli ambassador. He can't tell us names, or not allowed by, obviously, at security laws, but he does tell us that there are hundreds settling in this area here, in the area of Lisbon and the surrounding. And we put out feelers a couple of weeks ago. Um, the rabbi in, in the Chabad uh, Center put out feelers um, to perhaps people who are interested in having Hebrew taught to their children at nursery school level. We have a couple of teachers who are qualified to do that. But at the moment, there is no formal Jewish education. At the moment, there is no formal Jewish education at all. Okay. Um, but we do intend to start a nursery school based Rappachem soon. And if we can put that together, we simply build that. Because there are Israelis settling in this part of the world, and we need to facilitate for them continued adherence to Torah and Mitzvot. So um, we're looking into all of that. We have a youth movement called Or Hadash in our community. They are between 30 and 40 children. And um, they have informal Zionist education. We, as Rat Hashem, hope to stimulate also Bnei Akiva perhaps to come here and assist us in forming a more religious orientation for those children. So these are all plans in, in the making. There is a Jewish uh, growth in terms of numbers. There are people coming from other parts of the world where they don't feel as safe as Portugal is. And so Jews are coming to Portugal, whether we like it or not. Some of them are coming from Israel, yes. And some of them are coming from other parts of the world, including France, Belgium, tremendous anti-Semitism in some of the other European countries. If you can settle here and you can prove Sephardi ancestry, your passport is granted. You can come and live here. Okay, I have a question over here. Um, what is the relationship between Israel and Portugal in terms of United Nations resolutions? And how does Portugal position itself, you know, in regard to, you know, the political, um, you know, uh, background of, of what's going on with Israel and the world at the moment. Okay, you will all remember that um, our Prime Minister in Israel had uh, some meetings recently, the last year, the UN, and those meetings took place in Lisbon. In fact, he had his photograph with his wife. In the center of Lisbon, there is a special um, a monument to the memories. Uh, there is a church, and outside that church, Jews were burned alive. Um, they put a monument there to the victims of the Inquisition, public monument outside the church. So you can't go into the church unless you see the Magen David, the monument to the memories of the victim of Inquisition, persecution, and Jews who were murdered for no reason but to believe in Hashem. Now, there is that monument right there, and Netanyahu with his wife both of them took a picture. Um, so he had all his meetings privately done here. So he was meeting in Europe. But he had some private meeting and he chose Portugal because there is a healthy relationship between his government and the Israeli government. Uh, of course, it, it's in so many different layers and I, I, I don't know all the layers, but I do know that um, they, they are friendly to Israel, certainly uh, uh, friend, friendly in terms of not tolerating any racism in this part of the world under any condition and they treasure the presence of Jews in Portugal. I'm saying the government treasures our presence. The government acknowledges our presence. Um, I, I was due to meet with the president and the prime minister, but because of COVID, I haven't. And, and they, we would invite them to the shul and they will come. So, so, so they would take that, that offer if we extend it to them. So that's how closely they associate with the Jewish community and in making Jews feel welcome in Portugal. There is no anti-Semitism. This is a place where you can walk in a kippah. No one in the world 
will stare at you, and if they do, it will be with a smile. Any other question? Uh, just maybe one last question. That's rabbi to rabbi, and that is, um, what's it like being a rabbi there? What are your challenges as a rabbi? Um, what are your dreams for the community? How do you see it going forward? Oh, um, I see Bezrat Hashem. The community is functioning on a on a sort of structured level on Erev Shabbat, Kabbalat Shabbat, and Shabbat Shachrit. So um, we've had that through the entire process of the COVID. In fact, I think that Lisboa had the greatest minion in Europe, the last Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. We had 250 people, nowhere in, 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 in the entire uh, continent of um, Europe, there are 250 people allowed into any shul as far as we know. And we have those figures from, from the um, uh, European Union of Rabbis. Um, so, um, we only had lockdown now in the last two weeks. The numbers are very severe and the medical centers are overloaded. Um, so uh, the future, I see more Jews coming here, certainly starting a school, possibly Be'ezrat Hashem, we have a plan to open a kosher restaurant. If we open a school and we open a kosher restaurant and Jews are settling here and we have a function in Beta Knesset with Shirim and um, open it to Mondays and Thursdays at Kriyata Torah, so gradually and progressively increase, increase our services for every Jew who arrives in this part of the world, we will be thrilled. So the community functions, interesting by the way, the community doesn't have a facade because in the 18th century when they made a rule that no house of worship will have a front facade visible to people walking by except Catholic churches. So the mosque doesn't have a facade either, nor do we, but the synagogue is built at a slight off-center angle. It's a magnificent synagogue with the only synagogue I've seen with Agnesen with two mechitzot. During the, the Second World War, so many uh, people were coming over from France they didn't have sufficient space for the women. So the synagogue is very tall, so they built a third level mechitza here. So our synagogue has downstairs for the men um, and two mechitzot for women, one above the other, a total of 430 seats. It feels on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur normally. Of course, because of COVID, we had to allow only half and the other half went to a hotel nearby. At uh, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the Beta Knesset is packed up to 500 people and perhaps another 50 standing outside. So, so that's only twice a year. We don't want to be a synagogue twice a year. We want the synagogue to function at all levels, Be'ezrat Hashem. And I, I am energized by the, um, the, the, the promise of the future, Be'ezrat Hashem. If people are coming here, then we need to have a functioning community. And if it is me for the next foreseeable future that is here, then I'm very excited to, to bring more Torah, more mitzvot. We're doing lots of Zooms, we're doing lots of Shurim now, um, three hours a week already, right now, on a, on a weekly basis, because we're locked up. Okay, so um, Rabbi uh, Suiza, uh, I must say I've learned a lot, lots of, you know, we all know the general story, but lots of, like, little details and fascinating insights uh, really has, you've really enriched my own understanding of what's happened in, in, in your part of the world. And it's, uh, it's really, it's quite exciting in a way. And it's, it's wonderful to hear how, um, you know, how the Portuguese have embraced the Jewish community. I'm going to ask uh, Rabbi Gilbert to do like a, a thank you and a formal uh, goodbye. You're welcome. So just to uh, thank you, Reva, for your fascinating talk. There's been lots of questions that we haven't got to, which I apologize, uh, just because uh, we ran out of time. But we just wanted to thank you for giving of your time, for giving us uh, tremendous wisdom and understanding what's going on in Portugal right now. It is really an eye-opener for me and I'm sure for many other people. And uh, just from, you know, South Africa, where we uh, have felt the loss in Cape Town of you leaving Cape Town because you had a wonderful community and lots of followers and people who are connected to you. 
So they feel the loss, but I'm sure they've connected to this talk and, and see how amazing it is that uh, the void that you filled in Portugal. So from uh, us to you, we wish you lots of bracha and atzlocha. We wish you uh, only good things. Thank you for giving of your time. Thank you to Rabbi Hendler, to, uh, to Rabbi Shoy in his absence, to Mawap Sheva who facilitated this. We just want to thank everyone for being part of this amazing talk. And uh, thank you, Rabbi, for giving of your time. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, thank you Rabbi Gilbert. And, and um, if, we could if anybody is coming in this part of the world, extend them our invitation. Please make contact with us. We would be yeah. happy to facilitate. And we're going to do now a Jewish tour of Lisbon and the surrounding areas. We've got some people organizing that. So you can see the history in, with, with reality. Excellent. I think if anyone would be interested, maybe they can contact Rabbi Hendler just to get some details because there are definitely people on this that are asking questions a little bit uh, of, of people who have already got passports and want to come in a bit more detail. Perhaps I can touch base with Rabbi Hendler and he can put him in touch with you. Sure, you're welcome. Lovely, lovely to share with you and Bezrat Hashem, there will be more talks in the future and we'll link again. Right, thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much. And Thank that's you so